everybody. This is Dan. And this is Ron. And this is a nominee questionable movies. And today we have a very special guest on the program, somebody who I've wanted to have on the on the show for a long time. Uh, we have the one, the only, uh, internationally famous Fandor favorite. He's made movies. He's written books. He's probably he's, he's done other things I'm not even aware of. Photo montages. Photo montage. I, I am aware of the photo montages. Yeah. yeah. He's a busy guy, and so we got Mark Rappaport on the show today. Great to have you, Mark. Uh, great to be here. Not as not too busy to have this podcast. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's it's one piece of keeping busy, I guess. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, like in 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 the future, that the next time they're going to introduce you is a uh, you know known for his guest appearance on the Anomaly podcast. <laughs> good, good. Yes, I like that. I like that better than the other intro. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. So you know him from his appearance that's happening right now on the Nominee podcast. But yeah, so Ron and I watch if uh we watch more movies than we, we usually do to get ready for these just because we were enjoying them and I right. hadn't watched a lot of them in a few years. And so what what exactly we watch music, music to my ears, you know. <laughs> <laughs> And so, yeah, we watched Casual Relations, we watched The Scenic Route, we watched Rock Hudson's Home Movies, we watched a good sampling of the shorter uh, essay films that you've been working mm -hmm. on in the last, I guess, seven 20 years. years now, right? The John no, 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 no. Se like seven, years, seven years, seven years. Seven years? Started, I started making them in 2014. Oh, okay. Uh, we watched the John, John Garfield one said 2002. Maybe yeah. that was like a prototype uh that that was a commissioned uh piece that uh was the last film i thought that was the last film of my career so mm. oh wow okay and and it was commissioned they first uh it was supposed to be a five minute film and it, it was made for the jewish museum a show called uh jews and entertainment uh which was curated by jim hoberman whom you know probably and this other guy who, whose name i forget their, their boss wanted a five minute piece on John Garfield. And then he said, well, how about a one minute piece? And I said, what, how do you, what, what can be in a one minute piece? Hello, I must be going. So I made a five minute piece and they were very happy with that. And they showed that in the show. And, uh, but at the same time, I made a nine minute piece of stuff that they would not include, were not interested in including. And that's the piece that you saw, the nine minute piece. Yeah. And uh, we enjoyed, and this was the first time that Ron saw, I think, I mean, this is the first time you saw any of Mark's stuff, right, Ron? It is. I've heard a lot. I finally got to see a lot. I can only say good unless I'm saying, well, was it okay? Was it as good for you as it was <laughs> no, for me? No, no, we were having a good time. Yeah, we were, we were I mean, I mean, Rock, the Rock Hudson movie is always like, it, it's a very funny movie. You know, there, there's like, there, there's some kind of, you know, there's something poignant and tragic about it because of the, the overall Rock Hudson story, but the editing, it's a very entertaining movie when you're watching it, you know? Good. And Oh, sorry, go ahead. But no, this is what I like to do. I mean, I like to make movies that are entertaining. Uh, I kind of come from a background, well, I mean, I came of age during minimalist art, mm. and I started doing minimalist movies because you, you're influenced by the things that you see and the things that are around you. And uh, at some point I realized, you know, like it's more important to be entertaining than to torture people. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, I, if it's not entertaining, I don't want to do it. Yeah, mm. and, and I don't want to see it either. I mean, without mentioning names, Jean-Marie Straub and uh, Chantal Ackerman, it's like, let me out of fucking here. I, mean, I, just can't, I, I can't, uh, I just can't do it. You know, uh, life is too short. Uh, you know, that, I'd, I'd, be, I'd rather be a five hour movie. I, I'd rather be entertained than uh, be forced to think about what you want me to think about. Mm. So. Oh, then, then, then you've seen my, uh, my standard movie watching uh, fair. That's, uh, I watch some good movies. Um, and really thought-provoking movies and sometimes painful movies with friends. On my own, I watch every single mediocre comedy I can find on Netflix. Good, good for you. <laughs> and they've got a lot of them too, so you're oh, going yeah, to yeah. yeah, there's no shortage. <laughs> yeah. And if yeah. I feel like I've run out, Netflix recommends some more. Yeah, well, mm. they will give you more. Yeah. Just stay tuned. 
Yeah. <laughs> So I, I guess which movie should we talk about first? Should we go in chronological uh, you, order? Or? You you decide. Um, right. No, I, let me tell you about a movie I'm working on now, which okay. I think, yeah, yeah. I think it's, my, it's my best film, I think. I think it's the best written one. Um, it's called Martin und Hans. Uh, it's about this uh, actor, Martin Koslick, whose name I remember because my first boss in the film world had edited a movie in which Martin Koslick was the star. But uh, basically he was, he played Nazis and uh, he had this kind of lucrative career playing Nazis from 1939 on. And then in the middle of the forties, he also was in low budget horror movies. Anyway, the movie was gonna be about him because he has a, he sort of had, he has a small part in Foreign Correspondent and when I saw Foreign Correspondent again recently, I said, oh, Martin Koslick, yes, that, that's a good idea. So I did a little research on Google, of course. It's, it's not really research, it's just like pressing <laughs> buttons. I mean, in the old days, when I was a kid, you had to go to the library. Well, here you can get all the information you need and more uh, on Google. So uh, he was very uh, outspoken about the Nazis and, uh, they wanted to put him on a list. So he left Germany. He was also Jewish um, and gay. So, uh, so he came to America and he was in not too many movies in America, but uh, with the movie Confessions of a Nazi Spy in 1939, he played um, Goebbels. Mm. And he played Goebbels five times in his career. And in the, mo in the movie I'm making, uh, he, it's narrated by Martin and somebody else. I'll get to that point a little later. So uh, he says, "That's isn't that a good subject for a movie, Mark? <laughs> He's saying <laughs> to me, and I answer him, well, I think we've got enough with what we've got. But partly because I couldn't dig up all the Goebbels movies. And secondly, I, I don't think it's that interesting. Anyway, it's, it's a double biography. And it's the, this other guy is called Hans Heinrich von Twardowski who was also, he was an actor in German silent movies. And if not a, exactly a star, he was in a lot of movies, he, in very important movies. He's in uh, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari and, uh, and uh, a couple of movies that you may or may not have heard of. It's, it's irrelevant at this point. Anyway, he comes to Hollywood and he also winds up playing Nazis, uh, but he had a career before before we started paying attention to Nazis in Hollywood movies, he was in the Scarlet Empress with, uh, and became good friends with Marlena Dietrich as a result of it. And um, anyway, I I'm, I'm doing this research and I find that the two of them were lovers and were, love were together for 28 years. And I said, oh my God, I've got to do that. <laughs> I, 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 a friend of mine turned me on to Hans uh, Heinrich von Twardowski, whom I will call Hans from now on. Uh, and I was just going to do it about Martin Koslick, but then, then I said, oh, I've got to do this about both of them. And it's like two different narrators, plus me, so it's three different narrators, and uh, that's the story. So, yeah. so it, it, I think it was, it's more complicated than anything I've done before, and I also had to watch a lot of movies, a lot more movies than usual. And actually I'm having my assistant come over this week and help me look for even more movies that I haven't seen uh, mm. that he that can be found on the internet on you excuse me on YouTube, but I don't have I don't have the skills to um, but you have to it, they say it's not they say it's for free, but you get, have to give them your credit card. So what's the free part? Uh, anyway, there there are a lot of movies that I have not seen but expect to see and Maybe it'll make the film uh, longer and stronger. I, I don't know at this point. So, but I'm I'm ready to I'm I'm almost ready to mix it with what I've got. Oh, so you shot like uh, a lot of the the narration. Are, are they going to be like uh, kind of narration interstitials, like in the Gene Seberg and the? No. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Is it going to be feature length? No, no. This is thirty-seven minutes. You gonna fit all that in thirty-seven minutes? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> I fit in in less than 37 minutes talking to you, so. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair, yeah. Yeah, because uh, I, 
I didn't want to show too many movies from his horror, uh, low budget horror period. Uh, I, I guess since we watched your first feature, let's go in the complete opposite chronic chronological direction. Sure. What, uh, what was kind of the lead up to making casual relations? Because I've seen, I think, one or two of the early shorts when the, there was that retrospective and anthology. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess, yeah, like what, what was the moment where you were sort of like, I need to make these movies? Well, I had made, uh, I don't know, six or seven shorts. And I said, nobody pays attention to shorts. Nobody gives a damn. So I better make a feature. Mm. As, and I had no idea what I was doing. I said, okay, I want this. I want a scene of that. I want a scene of the other thing. And, and I was shooting uh, whenever I had money. And uh, yeah, I had to take jobs to uh, continue shooting. And uh, then I put it all together. And uh, it's color and black and white. And mm. until I actually... Uh, cut the color and black and white parts together, I wasn't sure that one part wouldn't be out of focus. Like if the color part is in focus, the black and white is going to be out of focus or the, the other way around. Uh, and it turned out not to be so. I mean, it was all in focus. And uh, I don't know. I just, I don't, I don't think I knew what I was doing, but I was, I knew something. And it seems to me it works because I've seen it fairly recently because I made a, an HD version of it uh, from the original negative. And it, I liked it. I thought it was good. So <laughs> that's all I got to say about it. So I loved your piece about it. And it's really wonderful. Uh, oh, for the Raiders Without Money? Yeah. 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 That, that was, uh, I mean, watching those, those movies when I was in college, that was, uh, that was a pretty big thing for me because it was, it was just so obvious. Like you were, you weren't really concerned about making the money back or at least to get that impression you're kind yeah. of doing what you want to do it's it's very funny but it's it's not like funny in a way that's like people pleasing yeah maybe people yeah. but like it, it doesn't like, seem like you're saying like it's, me. It just, it's, just it's fuck you funny to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah that that piece that you wrote about it it's in this uh there's this guy who lives in paris uh he spends most of his time in paris called Dennis Cooper, a novelist. And uh, he includes it in his uh, uh, Mark Rappaport Day uh, blog. Oh, I got linked? Yeah, yeah. Oh, awesome, awesome. Yeah. So look up Dennis Cooper or Mark Rappaport Day and uh, you'll find it. And it, it's your fault that I bought, uh, is it Recognitions? No. Uh, yeah, William Gaddis. Yeah, it's the like this, uh, when it's like uh, you use it to beat down home intruders, right? Or or to hold the door open while you're moving. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I bought it, uh, and now I'm going to blame you. And I could <laughs> read about 35 pages of it and I said, "This is so not for me." Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's. Uh, I mean, I I guess like I I found your work when I was kind of in the period where I was like. Uh, I guess kind of the opposite of what you were saying earlier was like, okay, if I want to get to the, the heart of the art, I, I need to torture myself or what I, maybe not torture it, because I, I really did genuinely enjoy a lot of it, but it, it just takes a lot of, like, you know, I, I love Gravity's Rainbow, but it took me six months to push myself through all of it. Mm -hmm. It was worth it, but it, uh, it's, it's not the same kind of enjoyment you get from, like, walking down the street and then having a beer and, and a burger or whatever right right um no, I, 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 yeah Brian, I'm sorry. Oh, i was just gonna say my gravity's rainbow experience is that i read 45 pages of it before i realized i was only on page 15. <laughs> <laughs> well there are some books that are torture but like if you work your way through them it's it, it's worth the trouble mm -hmm. uh for me that was uh uh, Sebald's Austerlitz, which I picked up like three times before I could actually get through it. And I think it's a great, great book. Um, so mm. different structure. Well, I, I think like the, the scenic route, because I had like a, a pirated copy of that that I got off the internet years and years and years ago because mm -hmm. uh, he who shall not be named said I should watch it. Mm -hmm. and, um, <laughs> and it took me like a good throw I think I got through like 15 minutes and I was like I don't understand what's going on I don't understand like 
anything but you know i just kept pushing and then eventually it's like oh okay it clicked and then i watched the rest of the stuff oh and, okay. and then well, you know and then once it clicked well thanks for pushing your way through it so I, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure a lot of other people don't it's got 1.5 million clicks on youtube and uh i'm sure it's just like clickbait you know everybody turns it off after three minutes like what the fuck is this uh but you know if i got a nickel for every every click that would be very nice but I don't. yeah that's kind of what we're i mean I, I think most of our videos is like there's that one video that's just like a two minute clip about how that guy's hat stayed on and the rest of it i think there's like three people who listen to every single episode and then there's a lot of people where they'll like jump around in the episodes I, I am not, I don't spend a lot of time on YouTube, so, and I certainly don't look for new, new, um, new developments or, or, I mean, I know there were a lot of stars of YouTube, but I've never seen those, uh, mm -hmm. those clips. <clears throat> it's, it's a whole other world. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's kind of weird. I like, honestly, a lot of the, a lot of it looks kind of like the Rock Hudson movie. You just got like a person sitting in front of a backdrop and then there's a lot of movie clips oh like there's a lot of film or actually the john garfield movie we were talking about that when we watched that it's like that's you were doing a lot of the stuff that ended up becoming kind of like streamlined for youtube movie essays like 20 yeah. years 20 25 years beforehand which was was interesting to look at i guess but well so, uh, somebody referred to me as the uh godfather or grandfather of uh these video clip movies i, I prefer godfather to grandfather but uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll take whatever i can get right yeah, yeah very it, different it, connotations yeah yeah <laughs> it, the, the only reason we got mark on today is because it's the it's the the day of his daughter's wedding <laughs> you know I, I just knew that i could ask him to come on and he couldn't refuse who's i'm sorry whose daughter's wedding Sorry, it was a Godfather joke, right? Because oh, like, God, God like, I right. can't refuse anything. It's the day of my daughter's wedding. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Uh, I, I, I'm not that uh, well versed in Godfather lore, so yeah, no, it's, it's, so we don't have to worry about any horse heads or anything. So no, 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 okay. All right. no. I'm, I'm <laughs> too much of a wuss to uh, kill a horse and you know cut its neck off and put it in somebody's bed. <laughs> <laughs> gold, well, that's why you gold, got an assistant mark gold silk sheet beds <laughs> and so casual relations how how did you go about releasing it once you were finished with it like how did you uh, well uh i was invited to this film festival in pesaro and uh someone was there from german tv my subsequently became good friends with uh and they bought it for german tv which gave me money to start my next film. Mm. Uh, and uh, in America, you probably don't know this name, but Fabiana Canosa, who used to program films at the, at the public theater for many, many years and did fantastic programming, um, had a theater on uh, like First Avenue, right by the uh, Triborough Bridge. I don't know which bridge goes by 59th Street. Well, whatever. Mm. It was like a little cinema there that he programmed for a little while, and uh, he played it there. And it got this terrible review from the New York Times. What, what else would you get from the New York Times? <laughs> it got into the New York Times. The most I ever got in there was the back of my head once. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, he had uh, advertised it as this outrageous movie, you know, outrageous was... Uh, capitalized and italicized and, and uh, the woman who wrote the review in the New York Times says the only thing outrageous about this movie is that it got released you know, I, something like that uh, so you know I think that was the last it played in New York until uh, until it played an anthology a couple of years ago right and that's that's when I saw it on an actual print so I, 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 it's released like in getting out of jail but it's not like released like a movie so <laughs> Okay, and so the, the next movie, that was uh, Mozart and Love, right? Yeah. Or was that local color? Yeah, it was Mozart no, and no, Love. No, no, it was Mozart and Love, yeah. So that also took a year and a half to make. And uh, 
I got a grant from New York uh, Council on the Arts. They had just instituted that program. And uh, that was very helpful. And the money I got from German TV was very helpful. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, it was a movie I really wanted to make. And everybody hated it. So, you know. I liked I, it. Oh, thank you. I think more people like it now than liked it then. Uh, it was shown at the Whitney. They had a program, uh, a film program at the Whitney with, um, you know, fold up chairs. That, that's the kind of program it was. You know, it's like this gray painted room with fold up chairs and a screen in, in, at one end of it. And I, I emptied out the theater every time it showed, you know, like <laughs> 10 minutes later, they were all, on, you know, e either leaving or fetching or something. Oh, and, uh, oh, and oh, I was going to tell you, the worst part was when I had a screening for friends and the actors and everybody was laughing. And I said, oh my God, what have I done here? And uh, it was horrible. And I went into the next room to this, where the screening room was, and I started crying. <laughs> and uh, oh, then it came out, and the New York Times reviewed it. I'll, I'll send you that review. That was really to cry about. It, that, that was in the days when the New York Times had uh, a night, a, an evening edition and a morning edition, maybe even a, an afternoon edition. This is like dinosaur time. You know, these things don't exist anymore. And the guy who wrote the review, I, I went out at 11 at night and went to buy a newspaper and I opened it and it's the most scathing thing ever written. And the guy says, and I, wa I walked out after 30 minutes and you're allowed to review this. And uh, he was also, and he, his, his experience was like, uh, he was a news, he covered news from Greece. So like that, that's like good enough, uh, a good enough resume to, to move, review movies, don't you think? So, uh, and then he wound up at the LA Times reviewing books. So I don't know, like once you're in that network, uh, they assign you to different posts and you- Oh yeah, I went to journalism school. It's, it's pretty much like once you're in the office, if they know you're gonna show up and you can string some words together, they'll assign you anything. Yeah, yeah. So that was that with Mozart and Love. And uh, I don't remember if I showed that to, uh, if German TV bought that, I think not, I think not. Mm -hmm. But I went to Germany with a copy of the print under my arms and uh, under my arm. And uh, I went to various TV stations and uh, uh, this, TV, this TV station, uh, ZDF did um, independent films and they would give you a little money. And uh, they liked it enough to uh, ask me for a couple of proposals. And uh, the film that I made with the, the money that they gave me was The Scenic Route. So, you know, I mean, as much as I complain, I was a very lucky fellow. And also you couldn't do this now. You just could not. Well, I remember the, the one time we talked on the phone, I was, I was like, what do you do to make movies like this and not starve? And, and you were like, the German TV station closed. There's no money left. I think it's <laughs> yeah, it, 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 true. This is true. Uh, and they gave me thirty five thousand dollars. I was I was on one of these things with uh, John Jost a couple of weeks ago, and um, I paid everyone twenty five dollars a day. Everyone, cameraman, gaffer, you know, whatever ev actors. Uh, $25 a day, except me. And I looked up what $35,000 would be today. It's $157,000. Now, where on earth could you scrape up $157,000 to make a movie like The Scenic Group? You can't. You can't. Who would you? Well, I don't know. John managed to get like $100,000 from that Italian guy in the 90s. I, I forget. I don't think the movie ever got finished even, but. Well, uh... John has that reputation and he's a very good talker. I'm, I'm not. $100,000 is it's not so bad. Well, and it's cer certainly for the way he makes movies. I mean, he doesn't uh, have cameramen and lighting uh, crew and uh, sets and stuff. So, you know, or, or actors that you pay and uh, great. Good for him. Great. And actually, how, how did you come to meet John? I'm kind of curious. I, I became friends with him as a result of the petition 
about he who shall not be named. That, that, that was how we became friends. I had met him at various film festivals and I thought, oh God, this guy is awful. <laughs> very, very, very cynical. And uh, he had this very annoying laugh that he, he's given up on. Uh, last <laughs> oh, couple he of must years. have gotten rid of it before I met him, yeah. Yeah, it was just this high-pitched cackle that, uh, like, stay away from my infant child kind of thing. <laughs> But, uh, you know, I mean, he's great. I, I really like him tremendously. So I guess I was there at Ground Zero for that then. All right. Yes, you were. You were. Um, and thank you for your involvement in it. Oh, I mean, that was, uh, that was a lot of fun. You know, the whole Occupy Wall Street thing ended and I needed some to rail against. Mm. And, and I went to kind well, of a crappy was... college and then going to, going to Boston University to meet with the dean and the dean's like sweating, checking his collar and he's like afraid of me like that. I got off on that big time. You know, I, I was not a that when I was 22 or whatever, yeah. Yeah, no, they were very afraid of you. That they said, and you're sending thugs to, uh, to intimidate. Right, I was the thug, I was the enforcer. That was great. Um, yeah, I said Dan's the muscle. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think thug uh, is a uh, Arabic, uh, Indian word coming from the word thuggy, which is, I guess, a thug. So, <laughs> little, uh, etymology, know, little yeah. etymology, etymology lesson. Here. And so you you keep making these these experimental narrative features up until I think the last one is Chain Letters in yeah. 1985. Yeah. yeah. And then there's no movies for a few years after that. Or yeah, I, I, to, right? there's a TV yeah. spin-off and exterior night and stuff. Yeah, I I was uh, sick for a while, and I also uh, had a uh, elderly mother to take care of. So, um, and uh, but but actually being sick was not was awful. But uh, as a result of that, I said, oh, you know, I'm never going to have the energy to make a feature length movie ever again. Mm. Uh, so I decided to make videos well it's the same amount of energy and time and uh money and uh troubles as making uh, a feature film but i i bought one of these uh archaic tanks called the pneumatic three quarter inch deck uh and uh, i installed it in my uh my apartment and started making rock hudson's home movies that's how it started and uh and then I just kept on going until, uh, well, no, that's not entirely true. Uh, I was also writing scripts that I would hope that I hoped would get produced, and uh, they never did. Uh, and a lot of them I never even got to first base. And then I wrote this script about Pasolini in the late '90s, and I was turned down for like 23 grants. And I said, I must be an idiot if I can't read the handwriting on the wall. And it was the best script I had written. And Willem Dafoe was interested in being in it. And, uh, and I couldn't get to first base with it. Uh, I mean, nobody wanted to have meetings with me after they read it. And, uh, and I wanted Angelica Houston to play Maria Callas. Mm. And uh, she, I didn't speak to her personally, but uh, her, I spoke to her assistant and she said, well, it's the best script. She said it's the best script she's read in half a year, and uh, but it's too dirty for her. I said, but like, not her part. I mean, she wouldn't have to say any <laughs> dirty words on the screen. And she said, no, no, no. She wants to do comedy, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, and I think Angelica was like in her late forties then. Mm -hmm. She wants to do comedy. She's a great, great actress. And I said, well, I had rented. Um, Right. Yeah, Bested Out of Carolina and uh, another movie that she had been in. And I said, well, I had rented them and I, you know, I'm not going to watch them tonight. <laughs> but that, I really know how to hurt uh, an assistant, uh, a, a star's movie, a movie star's assistant, right? Uh, and I thought if I could get Angelica Houston and Boom Defoe, that this would be a ticket. Yeah. yeah. But I couldn't, I couldn't. Mm. And uh, Willem Dafoe said, well, I could take it to my agent. I said, well, Willem, when you get to the part where Pasolini is being fucked by his father and blown by his brother, I mean, I'll be able to hear the, uh, your agent 
snapping it shut like that even from where I live. So, so that was so that was that with that. And how, I, how did you get Willem Dafoe on board in the first place for the? I I, 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 know, I know Willem. Oh, okay. It's from the downtown scene, and Worcester mm. Group, and uh, yeah, I've known Willem for a long time. And I wanted him to be in Chain Letters, but he had been in Streets of Fire, and his agents told him you cannot be in a low budget movie. You know, we're we're going to make you a star, and they did. They did. Yeah. So yeah, I like yeah. Streets of Fire for what it's worth. So I thought it was atrocious, but for what that's worth, <laughs> but, uh, I'm not saying it's a good movie. I'm saying I, you know. Yeah, mm. I, I mean, I, I have very few memories of it, but I remember at the time I didn't. And I'm glad that he's had this career that uh, where he can do anything now. Mm. Uh, low budget films, uh, films with the most obscure directors in the world, and then go to- Maybe now we'll make the Pasolini movie. He did make the Pasolini movie with uh, Abel Ferrara. And I almost had a heart attack when I read that. And I said, "Oh boy, here we go to we go here we go to court again." <laughs> but uh, so that that fortunately uh, that movie had nothing to do with my script. Uh, I'm sure that he mentioned it, Table Ferrara, because I saw that in a friend meant, uh, uh, mailed me an article in Hollywood Reporter that I had given Willem the idea or something like that. Uh, and it, it really stinks the Abel Ferrara version. <laughs> No, it, well, it does. No, I'm, I'm sure I, I never saw it. You know, I. But I, I lied. To, did I lie to you? I, I never. I get to like the chocolate mousse, and I'm, I'm out. Yeah, good. It's a good way to go. <laughs> <laughs> um. Wow, that's that, that, that's wild, though. And so, so, so I, you know, I decided I didn't want to make any more fiction features because I had, I think, like. 10 scripts that couldn't or wouldn't get produced. Mm. And, uh, and uh, when I did um, the John Garfield piece, I said, okay, you know, this is it. And uh, I, I was quite sick again. And after I got over it, uh, I decided I needed to change my life drastically. And uh, people were selling their lofts in Tribeca, uh, in uh, Soho like crazy. And when I found out that my neighbor had gotten this huge chunk of money for her loft, I and my loft was much better than hers because it was the top floor, had a huge skylight and uh, windows on both sides. Uh, and uh, I called up a that, real estate. That's where you shot a lot of the earlier films. like Right, uh, right. Yeah. yeah. And I decided uh, I'm going to move to Paris. You know, fuck, fuck this. And then I wrote a lot. And uh, then in 2007, I started doing photo montages, partly to illustrate some articles that I wrote. Mm. And uh, then I spent six years making, doing nothing but making photo montages. I made about 200. So, um, and I, I really liked it and I liked doing it. And um, then I said, you know, I, I can't just do this for a few friends and, uh, and uh, keep on doing this forever. And I said, okay, well, uh, it's time for me to think of something else. And uh, I, um, I said, okay, you know, I, I wouldn't be unhappy just taking long walks because this is Paris and mm -hmm. sitting at cafes for a hundred hours a day and uh, reading a lot and watching old movies on TV or in movie theaters. Mm -hmm. And then I was commissioned to do the Vanity Tables of Douglas Sirk. I was going to say the vanity tables of Mark Rappaport, but <laughs> you have any vanity tables, Mark? I don't think so. But uh, uh, anyway, I, I made the thing and I said, you know, I think this is what I want to do. And uh, that started me on this uh, on this path, this new newish career, mm. because you can do it all on your computer right. and you don't have to have a lot of money. You need some, but like to buy the DVDs, the Blu-rays. I have a part-time assistant and then you have to go record the uh, narration and then you have to do a little mix. And uh, uh, for a couple of years, I was very lucky. I had this assistant who would do everything and uh, including the mix, but his mixes weren't very good. And now I use a professional mixer and uh, I like doing it. I like doing it. So it's, it's not very expensive 
and uh, actually i i have made money uh sale not sales but uh, uh being programmed at various places and uh you know i was doing i well, you okay. had that relationship with Fandor for a while before. It looks like Fandor is kind of in a period of transition or something. But well, they were bought by Cynodyne, which I don't know what is. I don't know what that is. Uh, and um, you know, they still owe me money from the Fandor days. But Fandor was great because they actually gave me money to. They said, like, if it's under 25 minutes, we'll give you $1,000. If it's over 25 minutes, we'll give you $2,000. So that was how I was financing the films at that time. And there would, there would be royalties and uh, that's how you piece it together. I mean, I, as I said, I've been a very lucky guy in my life, uh, despite all of my uh, saying, oh, woe is me, misery me, uh, you know, like, uh, I never get a decent break and blah, 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 blah. Well, there's an old Russian proverb, right? The, the more you complain, the longer God lets you live. <laughs> right? I mean, this, this squeaky, uh, the squeak, the squeaky wheel gets oiled, right? Right. Sort of like the Russian proverb, but, uh, <laughs> but okay. So I'm going to live to be a hundred bucks. I mean, I, I feel like if I ever stop complaining, the Nazis won. Uh, <laughs> yeah okay yeah right that's that's the cultural heritage i mean at least in the u.s you know i kind of grew up as like world series jew right like i'm showing up for i think like passover because there's free food and then yom kippur because there's free food that's probably the, <laughs> the absolute worst reason to show up for yom kippur but it, you know if, if you will and you're really hungry at the end of it too so it tastes yeah. that much better yeah yeah well, it, it's a it's a good reason for uh, participating in the holidays. <laughs> I was in the park the other day uh, with my partner. Uh, there's a new park in my neighborhood, mm -hmm. and uh, and these two uh, Hasids come over and they say, "Are you Jewish?" Mm -hmm. And John John, who's the least Jewish person you could meet ever, uh, says, "No." And then I was thinking of what I could have said, but they they passed on already. So, but they came back like a little while later and they say, are you Jewish? And I said, in French, of course. Uh, yeah, so what? So what of it? And they said, uh, I said, but I'm a non-believer. And that, that, that chased them away real fast. <laughs> so I'm kind of curious how, so I'm guessing there was a slight, at least a slightly different creative process with the early narrative stuff versus the essay stuff. Uh, you know, the movies, they don't really look like other movies, so it's hard. Like when you're writing, do you just do you start writing? Do you have an outline? Do you have uh, you mean the short films? Uh, well, I, I guess let, let's go back to like the like like local color, let's say. Okay, like, yeah, that, know, was, that was that was all written. That was every, everything was written. Everything and, was written, but like the plot is so incredibly complicated. I feel like there had to be some kind of like conspiracy theory diagram before you started it or no. I, there were no diagrams, but uh, what I would do is, uh, I mean, I'm not really a storyteller. I figured that out. And uh, I, you know, you can't force yourself to be a storyteller. I don't have a real skill of narrative storytelling. Mm -hmm. And I'm never going to write a novel because I can't do that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I would, you know, I would just type everything and uh, I would put, you know, um, index card give or take i would put the various scenes on the wall and uh take a look at them and say oh well this should really should go there and maybe i need something here to fill it up and that's the way i wrote and uh and also i would just write like a ton of shit say okay you know whatever you write doesn't have to be great but you just keep on typing and uh which i think is really true and then you, the process of elimination, you say, this is not working. That's not, that's no good. This is not interesting. And, uh, and then I, you know, I would have a script. Uh, so it, 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 and then you have the actors learn the lines. I'm not as tough a taskmaster as Jacques Demy, who's a great, great filmmaker, in my opinion, who said, you have to get every comma and period right. And you have to do it exactly as I say, as it's written, you cannot change a word. Um, I wasn't like that, but uh, I could be if I, if I had that kind of money and power. 
and uh, that's the way I wrote. And then with the the essay films, did you did you kind of write things and then go like was the was the movie watch like the heavy movie watching research period intertwined with the writing or was it one after the other? Well, I I did write a lot about Gene Seberg, uh, mm -hmm. things that some somehow got used in the movie, but you can't deliver a written essay when you have this much space uh, to to put it into. So everything had to be simplified and uh, uh, shortened and uh, and re reworded so that it would fit into the, the space that you allotted to it. Uh, but writing it was very good practice for me. And uh, Rock Hudson Tone movies, I think I sort of improvised the whole thing. Uh, that's the thing about editing on three quarter inch or on your computer, you just you literally can talk into the computer and uh, record it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you can write over it and uh, rewrite it. And um, I recently had to write something about uh, a show at Anthology, which is on currently. Well, it used to be on. It's been <laughs> now it's been closed for uh, the hurricane. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, this is, this is the Rappaport lot, you know, but... Oh yeah, I just got a phone call actually while we were talking about ten minutes ago, and my my dad was like, "Yo, there's a hurricane coming." Which uh, that was the first I heard of it. Yeah. Oh, you didn't know about it? I didn't know. I didn't know it was a hurricane. I, oh, I, I mean, I still got a movie night planned tonight. I'm supposed to show a bunch of people spook who sat by the door. Uh, well, when you get evacuated, you'll know. So, uh, well, <laughs> where, where 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 do you live? I am uh, I'm in upstate New York. I'm about like equidistant between Albany and Saratoga Springs uh, mm -hmm. in a place called Mechanicville, mm -hmm. which uh, there's no reason anyone ever would have heard of it. I just heard of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess I'm the only reason. <laughs> like, it's, uh, it's nice. You know, I'm living in a little house in the woods, but I can drive and get to civilization easy enough. You know, I was, I was living in Boston for a while. Ron's still in Boston. And uh well, Ron's in Cambridge. The Cambridge people get offended when you call it Boston, but it's Boston. But the <laughs> uh, the driving here, the driving is so much. I didn't realize that. Like, I, I think driving around here versus driving in Boston like took ten points off my blood pressure. Mm. Oh yeah, um, I see driving in Boston as just a series of accidents waiting to happen. That's yeah. I don't like driving here. Yeah. By the way, Dan, I just checked. You should be getting some rain starting in an hour and the torrential downpours by about four o'clock so have fun oh, okay maybe we can <laughs> live stream it for the youtube channel there we go yeah yeah last the nominee it. podcast i'm just boarding up the windows tell it to cnn <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah so so with oh, the, the, oh, oh. oh i know what i want to say so i had to write this thing for anthology uh not for anthology, like if I wanted to get published in this online magazine, they said, well, you have to write it. Said, what the fuck is this? I mean, I've been working, you know, for the last seven years, I've done all the work. Why don't you do it? I didn't quite say that to the editor, but so I wrote this thing very quickly. And uh, I said in it that uh, at some point I realized that I'm not a narrative filmmaker. I'm a commentator. Uh, and that's what I do. I, I Talk back to the screen. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, I'm a child of uh, Mystery Theater 3000, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know when I made Shane Letters, which I think is my worst movie, and I have no desire to re-see it ever again. Mm -hmm. And uh, I I said why after after I made the movie, I said what was the reason for making this movie? I thought like I need to make another feature length movie. And get the grants to do it, and uh, and I did, and I did, and uh, I just don't see the point to that movie at all. And it's and, interesting you say that because I, I feel like I feel like I could give a pretty good breakdown of like at the very least like why everything up to imposters is like I, I think I have some idea what you're doing, why it's structured the way it is, what the mm -hmm. kind of themes are. Imposters and chain letters, I could not crack. I still am not entirely sure what those movies are about. You're not alone. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, take take a ticket and get online, you know. 
uh, yeah, I, I, I had when I recently had, well, not so recently, a couple of years ago, uh, I was making an HD of imposters. I thought, what a fucking silly script, but really well directed. Like, can, <laughs> can, can, can you can you separate the two? Does does that make any sense? Mm. Uh, not really, but um, you know, mm. that's what I that's what I came to realize. Uh, although, I mean, I do know what imposters is about, but uh, I I don't really know what chain letters is about. Not the not the heart of it. I don't. Mm. Anyway, I'm very happy doing what I'm doing because I am a commentator, not a narrative uh, kind of guy. Mm. And so I guess what movies what movies do you like unapologetically like? Well, uh, I would say that uh, Jacques Demy made five great movies that I can watch any time of the day. Alfred Hitchcock, for me, is God. Mm. Uh, almost any one of his movies I I, I've seen every one of his movies many, many times. Uh, Luis Buñuel, greatest. Uh, some of Jean Renoir. Um, Joseph Mankiewicz, George Cukor, Vincent Minnelli. Uh, Max Ophel, what did I leave out Max Ophels? I left out Max Ophels. How could I do that? So there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff to keep me busy uh, mm. instead of just uh, poisoning the well and saying, hey, it all stinks. I <laughs> No, I mean, it's it's fun to do that sometimes, you know, but it is. I, I'm just kind of curious because the, the Max Ophels was the one that I kind of guessed, like Mark must really like Max Ophels. I, I love Max Ophels. And uh, The Earrings of Madame Du is, for me, the greatest film ever made. Oh, well, let me add Visconti to that list. So, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff out there. Of course, you can't live on seeing movies that you've seen already. You can't live on that as a steady diet forever. But um, I try. <laughs> <laughs> well, I also I have a lot of DVDs and a lot of Blu-rays, uh, mm -hmm. some for work and uh, some for pleasure, many for pleasure. So uh, you come to my house, there's a lot of stuff to watch. Mm. So I'm trying to think what else I was going to ask. Uh... At least, Ron, do you have any questions? Like, you, you're coming at this stuff fresh. Like, this stuff's all been sitting yeah, yeah. in for like 10 years at this point. I'm curious, actually, this isn't about an individual movie per se, but you were saying earlier about, um, I, I just want your opinion on this, uh, about looking for, for stuff on, on YouTube. How do you feel if by chance uh, somebody had posted one of your movies um, not with, on YouTube without your authorization? Because that's a pretty common thing. <laughs> It happens all the time. There are a lot of my films on YouTube without my authorization. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I don't really have bad feelings about it because it, this is what I do. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, like a friend of mine, former friend of mine, uh, was outraged about, I think, my success with Rock Hudson's home movies and from the journals of Gene Seberg, because, first of all, I didn't mention her as an influence, which she isn't. And she had made a movie six years <laughs> earlier before Rock Hudson's Home Movies. And uh, she said, of course, you stole everything from me. Said, what the fuck are you talking about? You must be delusional. And the village voice quoted me as saying uh, that my influences were uh, Godard, the history of, uh, the history of cinema. And uh, I don't know if you know this guy's work, uh, Matthias Muller, German uh, director who makes collage films, basically. He's mm. absolutely brilliant. Mm. And she was outraged that I didn't mention her. And, and my thought was, you know, like, would Godard be outraged if I said that he was a major influence on my life? I mean, this is what art is supposed to do. You build on other people's mm. work. You don't start uh, from birth uh, inventing the world. The world invents you. And uh, yeah, so I feel... Uh, if people take stuff from my work, uh, that's fine with me. Mm. On the other hand, I've seen people who try to imitate my work. And I mean, I've, I've ripped off other people, but not this woman. But um, <laughs> so I don't care. If people, <laughs> I, I, I saw her film once and like I said, oh, it's OK, you know, mm. OK, big deal. And uh, well, you know, at my age, nothing is a big deal. Anymore. So, uh, but that wasn't true 28 years ago when I met Rock Hud when I made Rock Hudson's Home Movies. 
Yeah, I think people are allowed to use whatever they can use. And if it's better than the work that they've ripped off, so much the better. Mm. It's a compliment. Yeah. It's, it, I mean, it's also, it's, it's sort of like establishing like an artistic lineage, you know, it's like pointing people yeah. to the earlier film. Cause a lot of times what, like, I, I know that the film work that's influenced me, usually if it comes up in conversation with people that aren't directly related to this podcast, nobody seems to have ever heard of any of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like I started doing the movie night thing. Cause I, I started talking to some people and I was like, Oh, rules of the game. And, and they're like, what, what the fuck is a rules of the game? And I was like, Oh God, this is not good. <laughs> Okay, well, don't show them I Dalio or Rules of the Game. Right. Yeah. And uh, I'm kind of curious with the Rock Hudson and the Gene Seberg movies. Did you ever hear anything from people in their estates? Like, I heard from people who said, oh, you know, so and so dumped me for Gene Seberg, famous director. Like, <laughs> this I didn't want to hear. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't need all these stories. Uh, about who Gene Seberg fucked and who she didn't fuck. And uh, yeah, this sort of famous producer says to me, uh, well, uh, yeah, I knew, I knew Gene Seberg and uh, she would look into your eyes for one second and decide whether or not you were going to sleep together. Isn't that what everybody said about like Edie Sedgwick back in the day too? The, that woman who was hanging around the Warhol factory? Yeah, uh, no, I don't, I don't know. Okay, yeah. Uh, I mean, it just seems like in the 60s, a lot of people just presumed, like, if a woman looked at them, they would size them up for sex or not. Like, well, I feel like I've read a lot of accounts of people saying stuff like that. Uh, oh, and to John Simon, the, uh, the film and theater critic of New Yorker, no, not New York, New York magazine, uh, said, oh, do you know what, how Gene Seberg met her third husband? Like, he sent her a note well, the two of them were in a cafe and he said, I want to fuck you. Now, do I need this stuff? I, I, I didn't need this stuff. And, uh, and I wouldn't have used it and couldn't have used it even if I knew about it beforehand. Mm -hmm. Right, because they're not, they're not gossipy movies. You're not making like the E-True Hollywood story. Yeah, it's not Hollywood Babylon. Right, there's already two Hollywood Babylons, right? There's already two of them, yeah. Yeah. And uh, actually, I started watching the other night, partly because this uh, really very interesting director, William Dieterle, uh, mm. directed uh, with Max Reinhardt, the theater genius of the early part of the 20th century, uh, A Midsummer's Night Dream, in which Kenneth Anger has a big part when he was a little boy. So, and I thought that that was a lie on his part. But uh, there it says in IMDb, Kenneth Anger playing yeah. whatever. Well, I mean, didn't he, he grow up around Hollywood people and that's how yeah. he had like yeah. all the dirt to make the Hollywood Babylon book? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, like, I'm not interested. It, who fucked who and when they did it is not that, in, I mean, maybe interesting to talk about, maybe interesting gossip, but it's not interesting in a movie, I don't think. Yeah, I think I think that's that's accurate. Like, there's a lot of those biopics where it's basically like, just sort of a dramatized wikipedia page with a few gossipy bits like i feel yeah. like that's most of them yeah yeah with actors who don't look at all like the actors they're portraying well i mean i i, I mean I, I don't know if that guy in rock hudson's home movies looks too much like i i i, I mean it's got to be hard to find somebody who looks like rock hudson who isn't he's, rock hudson he's but. tall he has like a good pompadour it's fine with me you know mm. Uh, so many people were fetching about that, you know, when when the movie came out. Oh, but he doesn't look like Rock Hudson. It's well, like, that, was a, that was one of the things I liked about it. Well, I saw a TV movie about Audrey Hepburn with, I can't even remember this woman's name. Roseanne Barr? No, no, no. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, she used to be a child star uh, and looks nothing at all like Audrey Hepburn. And... Uh, it was more complaining about my Rock Hudson than about uh, this actress playing uh, Audrey Hepburn. I don't get it. Mm. And uh, who would you get to play Clark Gable if you're doing, uh, I don't know, a version of Clark Gable's life? I mean, people don't look like each other unless they're, you know, it's a freak uh, accident. Mm. Jennifer yeah. Love Hewitt. Was it a 2000? Jennifer Love that's, yeah. that's the, yeah. She looks as much as like Audrey Hepburn as I do, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I mean, I'm trying. I think I think the worst case of that was John Wayne and the Conqueror. It's what? Uh, you ever see that movie where John Wayne plays Genghis Khan and then everybody? Oh yeah, you, after I, her, I, I, I was gonna, I was going to do a script about Howard Hughes that never came together. Uh, Howard Hughes fascinated me for a couple of years, mm. and uh, so I've seen the Conqueror uh, more times than most people would have. <laughs> and I presented this as an idea to the Worcester Group to do a theater piece about the making of The Conqueror and everybody dying of cancer 30 years later, um, making The Conqueror in this uh, red hot uh, uranium deposit uh, bomb area. Mm. And uh, they weren't interested. They say, well, you want to make theater, we want to make movies. <laughs> so <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was that for that. But uh, I think that there's really, really great material there to work on. Maybe I'll do. Maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll do that. I'm, yeah. I'm looking. I mean, and, and there's a anytime John Wayne tries to do because there's and like otherwise I, I love this movie, A Long Voyage Home by John Ford, the one where they just like they're all sailors and they're alcoholics, and he kind of does the Eugene O'Neill thing, right? And but you got but you got John Wayne with this this Swedish accent, and he's trying he's trying his damnedest to do a convincing Swedish accent, and it's just it's surreal and it takes me out of the movie every time I'm seeing like, I am John Wayne, I am Swedish, you know, like. This is so well, uh, I will tell you this thing that I don't remember, but I read about fairly recently. Uh, Billy Wilder's first movie as a writer director, The Major and the Minor, Ginger Rogers is on a train and uh, the conductor, the guy who's collecting the tickets asks her uh, where she's from. She says, Sweden. And, uh, he says, well, talk, say something in Swedish. And she says, I want to be alone, which is like <laughs> the famous Greta Garbo line. <laughs> anyway, so Swedish equals Swedish. Mm. Yeah. Swedish. On the other hand, like you buy these things when you watch a movie. I mean, it's, it, it really is the suspension of disbelief. You know, uh, big deal that he doesn't have a Swedish accent. Uh, mm. It's not in, that important. Um, Actors pretending to speak a foreign language. Uh, most of the time, they, they're, they're, their efforts are useless. Mm. But we, we know it's so and so playing a right. scene. Or well, I think it's it's just heightened because it's John Wayne for me. Like it, there's yeah. this real like cognitive dissonance there. That's really it's right. like hearing William Shatner try to sing or something, <laughs> right? Like <laughs> ever heard like William Shatner do Mr. Tambourine Man? Right? He's he's a very good singer. He's, I, you know, it's weird because like the records are technically bad. I've listened to those William Shatner records. Like, oh, he really does sing. I thought you were kidding. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. He does like, he did a version of Mr. Tambourine Man. He did a version of Rock. He did this version of Bohemian Rhapsody where it, there's a music video and it's just this disembodied head in the sky. And oh. there's these two kids on Makeout Point. Like, I, I probably watched that like 40 times because I, it's just something about it. Like I laugh every time. It's it knows exactly where to hit me, you know. The the minute I'm at, off this uh, podcast, I'm going up to. I'm going to go check YouTube for William Shatner sings. Do you, do you do you enjoy like so bad it's good kind of movie? Well, yeah, I guess you, you said like a mystery science theater. No, when I saw no, the, but... the first and only time that I saw mystery science theater, I said, "Oh boy, this is for me. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is what I like doing." This is what I do when I'm in the movie with somebody and I really hate the movie. I just talk nonstop and complain about the movie. And, oh God, then look at that. Look at that angle. Look at the scenery. Look at the this, look at the that. Uh, so yeah, that was right up my alley. And uh, as I said, it was more influential on my making movies than the former friend's movie that she said I ripped off, so. <laughs> I, I didn't give them due uh, uh, acknowledgement in interviews. Well, and I think like Mystery Science Theater and like Beavis and Butthead, like I, I'm 32 now. And for the people around me, that was the first place most of them were introduced to film criticism. Like mm. the idea you could talk back to the television. Uh -huh. And I have had a lot of conversation with John about Beavis. John is like a big Beavis and Butthead guy, uh -huh. surprisingly, but or not that surprising. Like if you see him with Steve Black, they basically are Beavis and Butthead. Uh -huh. <laughs> I want to get the two of them on the show because it's hilarious. But, uh, 
<laughs> well, you know, Kellyanne Connor looked like uh, one of those guys with the protr with pr protruding jaw. And uh, I don't think enough was made of it in the Kellyanne Conway days. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah. She looks like uh, she looks like Beavis. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because Butthead's the 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 one with the brown hair who's marginally smarter. Mm. I guess it's, he's the most articulate of the three Stooges. <laughs> right, junk um, culture. How we love it. Junk culture. Yeah. How we need it. Yeah, I mean, I, I need it, like, as a palate cleanser, after because, like, I like watching the really difficult stuff, but then I got to watch, like, you know, a few episodes of, like, Degrassi or something afterwards. <laughs> mm. <laughs> well, I was watching one episode of White Lotus the other night, and uh, it's so damn unpleasant. And I, but I said, I, you know, I'm going to continue watching this. <laughs> and for some reason, the, the uh, channel here in, in France, I don't know if this is true in America, but cable channels, uh, they have replay. And you can go and see things that have, they've played in the past. I don't know. Anyway, I was, so White Lotus was on replay, uh, the, the first episode. And I thought I was going to watch, you know, the second, third, and, and so on. But it was gone. But it's like so unpleasant. Uh, uh, it's a palate cleanser for the end of the day. I, I want to make sure people know that you you did write a book. The book is good. The book is extremely entertaining. I've told Brian to read it a few times. Uh, okay, I wrote a lot of articles for this French magazine in English, uh, translated into French, called Trafic. I think the title is from a, a Jacques Tati movie. Mm -hmm. And I also wrote articles that were printed in this ma magazine called Cinema, French magazine. And... Uh, by the editor of Trafic, who is like the most famous, most famous French film theorist. I mean, he is like a god. People bow down when he starts coming, you know, when he's coming down the aisle, they throw rose petals and they try to kiss the hem of his gown. And uh, he said, well, we'd like to do a, a book of your articles. And I said, great. And then, uh, then I started writing ferociously uh, new articles that were not in the uh, former uh, journals, uh, articles that uh, were strictly for the book. And uh, they printed the book and it was great. This was like another stroke of luck. You know, Rappaport, you are one lucky guy. And, uh, you know, it sold very, very few copies. And then, as you know, I put it online in, in as a Kindle and uh, similarly sold very, very few copies, so. It's, it's hard to sell books. You know, I, I wrote a book about the whole Occupy Wall Street thing. I had it done within six months of when the thing was over. I only printed a thousand of them and I still got 500 in my garage. Yeah, yeah, Ryan got a few of them. You know, I was handing them out basically as just like business cards at a certain point because I was like, mm. the only way I'm ever going to get them yeah, out. Yeah, well, yeah, it's, it's difficult to get people to sit down and read stuff. It just is. And now more than ever. Um, and Owen, and just, uh, just to make sure this is in the recording, the book is called The Movie Goer Who Knew Too Much. Yes. And you can find it on, uh, at least you can find it in English on Amazon as a digital thing. And I think that was, I think it was only digitally released in English. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was, I had a, an email meeting with, somebody at University of California Press. And she said, oh, you're a very good writer. You'll, you'll, find, you'll find a publisher for this. And then she said, well, I mean, we really like it, but what's the hook? I think there's plenty of hooks, right? You get to hear the first person perspective of the guy in the, the creature from the Black Lagoon suit. They're the publisher, they put stuff out. They know the hooks better than I do, mm -hmm. or should. I, I, you know, this world baffles me, I must say. Yeah. I just found something by Jonathan Rosenbaum about uh, the moviegoer who knew too much. And he just says he talked about it before, but said, let me just reiterate here that if you haven't yet checked the sucker out, you've got a lot of unhealthy fun awaiting for you. The sucker? He said that? He said the sucker, but I think it's like, hey, this great thing here. So I know, I know, no, I know, oh, what, okay. I know what sucker means, but it's like... It's yeah, it's funny because that doesn't sound how John talks very much. Honestly. No, it doesn't sound like because we uh, got John on for like his, two hours. If you like, he a must month have heard his, 
He must have had his teenage assistant uh, write it. I mean, that's <laughs> just, like this sucker out. Yeah. But would you say that a lot of unhealthy fun waiting awaiting you? Is that a is that a fair description? Or? No, I don't think. I think it's quite healthy. Well, I I don't mean like it's good for you when it's like it's like a kale uh, quiche. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, no, it's not unhealthy. It's, hey, hey. I, I I think if you're interested in movies, it's interesting. Uh, it's like yeah, I mean, I think like like Matt would be the perfect audience for this book. Our, our friend oh, okay. Matt who ran a, a movie theater out. So he he founded and was a programmer for a um, for small independent cinema in Amsterdam uh, that lasted about I think about four years. He had oh, to shut cool. it down for the pandemic and ended up having to shut it down permanently. So it's gone. But he's doing some online programming. But he actually watched a few of the movies with us, and uh, on some online thing, people were—I think it was on Twitter or something—it was going around like, "What are the five uh, new things that you saw this year? Your favorite?" So he listed Rock Hudson's uh, home movies as one of them. So oh, he's a fan. Right. Well, of course, now the pandemic continues. I think this will be known as the COVID decade, and you can't get anywhere without uh, uh, a COVID uh, clearance test. So, um, I mean, even going to Holland uh, by train is like an. Oh, he does it all online now. So yeah, it just, I, really I'm, just, I'm just, I'm uh, just, I'm just wool gathering. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, he's yeah. yeah. In, in relation to uh, his being shut down as a result of the uh, mm. coronavirus. So I mean, I think that like still people are not going to the movies as much. Certainly not in Paris. Uh, I know that uh, the box office dropped 70% the week that uh, the Delta virus was talked about. Mm. So, yeah, it's going to be a, it's going to be weird coming out of this without like a ready made excuse why I've been sitting in my house watching movies all day. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, but, well, uh, it, the, the lockdown was very good for me because I had no distractions and I made four videos that year. And one, is, I think, is one of my best. Uh, so, I mean, there was nothing to do. You couldn't go to a restaurant. You couldn't go to a bar. You couldn't go to a cafe. You couldn't go to the movies. You basically didn't even want to leave your house. There was no reason to. Uh, and Paris shut down. It's just like, it's, it's a nightmare. It was a nightmare. And, uh, you know, Paris without the cafes and bars is like, what? It's like, Czechoslovakia during World War II. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It was it was just Great. awful. So uh, I I went up making four videos, which which was a lot for me. Mm. But I had a lot of time on my hands, and I can't believe how much money we saved by not going to restaurants. Mm. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I saved a ton. Yeah. Like at its beginning. I mean, I, I was, I was living with somebody at the beginning of the pandemic and we got one of those kits to like turn your dinner table into a ping pong table. <laughs> and I was playing like three hours. I was getting really good at ping pong. I was, uh -huh. it was, it was a good time. Oh, so yeah. you're going to be at the ping pong Olympics uh, in four years. Probably not. I I've been training to get the, I wanted to go to the world Tetris competition but I don't, I think I'm too old to get the like hands. You got to be really good at Tetris at this point to get to the world competition. But like I can play really fast Tetris now for whatever that's worth. Good, good. <laughs> well, now you're getting good at, you're getting really good at uh, video. Um... Pinball. Yeah. Yeah. I've been, I've been playing a lot of like emulated pinball and I kind of like, I get, I, I'm getting, you know, I'm, I'm not like, uh, you know, I'm not Tommy or something, but I, I'm, I'm getting better. You know, it's, it's a good, it's like, it keeps your hands busy. You got to think really quickly, but it's not like, uh, it's like junk TV, right? It's like, it's not strenuous. It's like a good palate cleanser. Hmm. And, uh, yeah. So, so I guess, is there uh, anything else you want to talk about, promote any, any words you want to make sure the audience doesn't leave without? I was talking with my former wife the other day and uh, she said, remember that thing you said that was so great? And I said, hit me. And she says, uh, you said, spite is greater than irony. So you could leave, you could leave your audience with that to think about. I'm getting that knit on a pillow. 
So <laughs> learn how to do needlepoint and do it yourself. Yeah. <laughs> that is pretty great. Yeah. And then anytime that somebody comes to visit you that you're not too fond of, you just throw a pillow at them as they walk. Well, that kind of reminds me of that thing William H. Gass said for the, the Paris Review. They asked him, like, why do you write? And he said, to get even. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, cool. So thanks for coming on, Mark. Well, thanks for having me. It was uh, much more fun than I expected. <laughs> okay, that's uh, <laughs> and where where should people find your stuff? Uh, well, actually, talking about uh, being a recipient of good luck, Kino Lorber, which is a major hmm. distributor to uh, theaters and uh, and I guess video on demand, has taken hmm. all of my stuff from 1966 up to the present and, uh, and beyond. So um, I don't know, you just have to watch out for it. It's, it's not oh, gonna be- You got a deal with Kino? Yeah. That's awesome, congratulations. Yeah. Well, thank you. This was after trying uh, every goddamn distributor in the world. <laughs> and uh, I didn't even think of Kino Lorb because at one point they turned down uh, from the journals of Gene Sieber because they thought that they would get their ass sued off. And they took all of this. And the, the woman who selected, uh, the woman who gave the okay, was a senior vice president, worked as a production manager. No, she was like a, an assistant director on imposters and she distributed from the journals of Gene Seberg. So, you know, like we have this past that kind of, I guess the moral of the story is be nice to everybody, you know? Be nice to your crew members because you never know where they're going to turn up in uh, 40 years. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that took me a while to learn, but it's important. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, cool. So I'm still Dan. And I'm still Ron. And today we've had uh, we've had Mark Rappaport on the show. You can check out his, his uh, book, The Movie Goer Who Knew Too Much. You can check out a bunch of his movies. They're, they're all over the place. And soon they're going to be coming out from Kino Lorber and uh thanks for coming on the show and we'll we'll see you uh or wait no I can't say we'll see you at the movies anymore because we figured out I was like subconsciously right. plagiarizing I'll see you with a mask on right yeah, yeah, yeah. I won't recognize you when I see you because you'll have a mask on that that'll be my new sign off <laughs> <laughs>